um, from your 20 foot to your Y height. So we got all that added together. So as our force, all we have to do to get work is pretty much integrate. And there's not any more to it than that. So we're just going to integrate work is integral. So we have function of y, so it's going to be f of y dy from a to b. So we got f of y is 6.6 .6 minus 0.8y. dy, what about endpoints, end values? I need a small y and big y. Small y or big y? go from 0 up to 20. So we need a, the smallest y, biggest y. So we're going to go 0 to 20. So that's it. Integrate and you have the amount of work that you need right there. So I will give you one of these two types of problems for work. So I won't, uh, you won't need to know lots of other physics laws. So I think Hooke's law is the physics law you need and uh, the rest is just going to be uh, setting up some word problem where the it'll be similar to some amount of weight of uh, rope or wire or something like that. So it will be either really similar to this problem or it'll be a spring problem, one of the two types. So that is the end of chapter six. Now we're going to an entirely new chapter. And this will be sequences where we're going to start. So I'll start definition. So a sequence is a list of numbers, an ordered list of numbers. In our case, it'll be real numbers. Generally, a sequence is just an ordered list of elements, but we'll be using real numbers. And how we're going to denote it so we'll go a1, comma, a2, comma, a3, comma, dot, 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 comma, a n. So this will be a finite sequence. And if you go a1, a2, a3, that doesn't end. We would know what comes next, A4, A5, but it doesn't end, so that's an infinite sequence. So we're going to do a little bit with finite sequences, but we're mostly going to be focused on infinite sequences. Another thing we're going to need is a factorial. So let's write that down. Factorial uses a notation exclamation point. So n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot 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 all the way down to 1. This would be very lame if I went all the way down to 0. What would I get if I multiplied numbers all the way down to 0? Zero. That wouldn't be very useful if every factorial was zero. So stop at one. You technically can stop at two. Doesn't matter. Uh, times one doesn't do anything. Now we, let's compute a few factorials here. Uh, we'll do one factorial. One factorial is a little weird. Doesn't quite fit the pattern, except just the last, the number one at the very end. So that's one factorial. Two factorial is uh, two times one, which is two. 3 factorial, 3 times 2 times 1, 
I could write it as 3 times 2 factorial. So what I do is just pull out uh, the first term and then it will be a factorial with one less. And 3 times 2 is 6. All right, 4 factorial, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, or 4 times 3 factorial, which will be 24. All right, so get 5 factorial and 6 factorial right now, and use the uh, property 5 times 4 factorial, and then 6 will be 6 times 5 factorial. So use that, basically you're factoring out the first term. So go ahead and get 5 factorial and 6 factorial. A little multiplication practice. How bad are you at multiplication? You've already given up and broken out a calculator? Is that for 5 times 24? Oh man. <laughs> yeah. Alright, 5 times 24, 5 times 5, or 5 times 25 is 125, and you just got 5 less, so 120. And the big one, 6 factorial. 720. So we got 120. You could probably get the 720. Uh, I don't really want to go past that, but I think you can see how we get 8, 9, 10, etc. factorial. One thing you should notice, these grow really quickly. 10 factorial would be a pretty big number. I think you can imagine 20 factorial, really big number. So this grows really quickly. At some point, we'll compare it to the exponential and see who wins. So that's one of the things we'll be doing is seeing, uh, comparing to see who uh, or what sequence gets bigger more quickly. There's another special factorial. Zero factorial is defined to be one. Doesn't really fit the pattern. It wouldn't fit this pattern that I wrote down, but it's just defined to be one. So zero factorial is a little bit special. I'll put a little asterisk next to it. So it doesn't fit the pattern of all the other ones right there. So that's factorial. Now we're going to do a very easy example. We're going to write out the first four terms, and I'm going to give you a formula for a n. So we're going to write out the first four terms of this sequence. It's going to be a very easy example. Given a n is negative 1 to the n power times 1 over n. So find the first four terms. of the sequence. Now should you start at A0 or A1? Just depends. Let's uh, start this one. Why would it be a bad move to start this one at A0? This particular AN. Why would A0 be bad? Undefined. So it's a really good reason to start this one at A1. So we'll find A1, A2, A3, A4 right now. <coughs> Should have gotten minus one, one half, minus a third, positive one fourth. So you probably didn't learn very much here, except what negative one to the n does. So what does negative one to the n do in our uh, sequence? Is it negative or positive? Yeah, so it alternates our sign. So it goes positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So the main thing to learn here, negative one to the n alternates. sign. Uh, what if I wanted to have A1 as positive and then I wanted negative, positive, negative? Like I wanted the exact opposite sign here. N minus one. You could plus use one. N minus 1 or N plus 1. 
that would work. You could also just go negative 1 times negative 1 to the n, which of course is negative 1 to the n plus 1. So that would also alternate signs, but starting the opposite sign the first time. So either one of those two alternate signs. There's some we other weird ones you can use. I think cosine pi n works. That's another one. What is cosine of 0? 1. Cosine of pi, negative 1. Cosine 2 pi is 1. Cosine 3 pi is negative 1. So this is sort of a sneaky way to alternate signs as well. So this will alternate between uh, <coughs> negative 1 and positive 1. So all these right here are ways to alternate signs. Uh, you could have a sneaky way to do this. I could have rewritten a n. No, I couldn't do it here. But something like uh, negative <coughs> 3 to the n power would also alternate. And it would alternate because I could write this as negative 1 to the n times 3 to the n. So I could break out the negative part, basically, and just think of this as negative 1 to the n times 3 to the n. So you can sometimes get a sort of sneaky alternating sign if it looks like this. So you don't directly see negative 1 to the n, but there is a negative to the nth power. So it will have the alternating sign property. So now we're going to do the opposite. I'm going to give you a sequence, and we're going to find a formula for a n. And this is... Uh, definitely more difficult. So I'll pick a, hopefully this one will be pretty easy. So given the sequence 2, 4, 12, 48, 240, dot, dot, dot. Find a formula for a n. So we have to decide Let's just, for now, let's start at A1. So make the first term will be A1. So we got A1 is 2, A2 is 4, etc., etc. What pattern is happening as we go from 2 to 4, 4 to 12, 12 to 48, 48 to 240? So let's think about this. If I add, I add 2 to 2 to get 4. So let's try an additive pattern. Does plus 2 keep working? 4 plus 2? Not 12. It would be 6. So that's out. So it's not an additive pattern. What's a, another good pattern to try? It's double, so we could try to see multiply 2 times 2. So if I multiply by 2. But what is 4 times 2? 8, not 12. So that's not going to work either. So I think somebody did figure it out, but I'm going through very slowly and, and analyzing every possibility. All these are even. So I can use my favorite F word. Factor. So let's factor the 2 out, see what we get. So this is 2 times 1, 2, 6. 1, 2. 6, something else I'm not thinking of, 48, 24, and 120, that pattern looks familiar, oh, it's that one right there. 1, 2, 6, 24. Next would have been 120, 720. So not a pattern that you're used to seeing. So you want to get a little more familiar with uh, factorial. So this is going to be a factorial pattern. Not easy to see. <coughs> so I could rewrite it. This goes 1 factorial, comma, 2 factorial, comma, 3 factorial, 4 factorial, 5 factorial, 
etc., etc., times 2. Uh, 48 turned into 24. So it's not easy to see the factorial pattern in the original, but once we cut it in half, we factored out, the factorial pattern is a little more obvious. So we're going to go with a n is going to be 2 times n factorial. So it's basically a double factorial. Well, I shouldn't use it. 2 times the factorial. So we'll do a few more of these problems. I'm thinking it's probably been since middle school since you did something like this. Although probably not to this extent where you're writing the formula for the nth term. You're probably thinking about stuff like this, but not really writing stuff like this. So we'll do a tiny bit more practice. So we'll go with two more examples here. One ninth. Oh, this one's too easy. One twenty seventh, one eighty first, dot dot dot. So, what pattern is happening here? What do I multiply by to get to the next term? One third. So, this is multiplied by a third. So, that's the pattern your brain should have detected. So we're going to multiply by one third, multiply by one third. Something a little bit weird happens here. Your intuition may tell you this should look like something like one third, maybe times n. That's not the pattern. That's not how to multiply by a third each time. So the way you multiply by a third again and again is you take one third and you raise it to the nth power so that every extra n you pick up you get another times a third times a third times a third so the multiplicative pattern actually looks exponential right here which is a little bit strange that's not intuitive so i just want to warn you about that you're multiplying by another one third every single time is this a n actually this uh is a one one ninth right now No, it's one third. So, how do I get it to be one ninth? So, I can, there's a few things. I can go n plus one. I could have multiplied by another third, which would have been the same thing as adding one to the exponent. So, I need to account for that. So, I could have either went that way or written it as one third times one third to the n doesn't matter which way you go, they're same, uh, the same thing. And now a1 is uh, a ninth, not a third. So a1's a ninth, a2 is uh, 1 over 3 cubed, which is 1 27th, and then we get 1 81st, etc, etc. So this is what we call a geometric series. And this has a multiplicative pattern. So our last example, that's going to be like this. We'll go negative. 20 comma positive 5 comma negative 5 fourths plus 5 sixteenths minus 5 
64th swoops. I wanted a comma in there, not a plus. All right, pattern. I'm saying one fourth. So alternate signs. So I need either the uh, one fourth to the n times negative one to the n, or just negative one fourth to the n. So you can decide which one you like to use. So does this get us? First of all, does this get us a negative when n is one? It does, which is what we want. So that's good. Does this get us twenty? Sure doesn't, so we got a lot of work to do. What could I factor out of this entire series uh, sequence right here? I can get a five out of there. So let's rewrite it five times. So it will go negative four, comma, one, negative a fourth, one sixteenth, negative one sixty fourth. So we definitely need a times five in here. So we need to multiply by a five. But this still doesn't start where I want it to start. When n is 1, we get negative 1 fourth. So when n is 1, we'd be looking at that term right there, the way I have it written right now. So if I wrote a1 is negative 1 fourth times 5, which is negative 5 fourths, and that would be the um, you know, third term right there, not the first term. So there's a few ways to account for this. What are some things I can do? I can multiply by 16, or I could change the index, basically move it back two. So two ways to address this. So let's call this BN, because it's not the one we're actually looking for. So I'm just gonna call this BN and B1. So we'll go AN, so we need to multiply by 16. So here's one way to do it. And I keep uh, multiplying by negative 1 fourth, so this should fit the pattern. Yes, yeah, so this would work right here. So we multiply by 16. There is another way to do it. So I heard it whispered correctly, minus two. So what was three, I would like to be one. So because this was where B1 was, what I really wanted that to be was B3. So I needed to move it back two. Now if you're not sure if it should be plus two or minus two, I recommend guess and check. See what you think it should be, and then plug it in. Takes only probably five seconds to plug in one and see what you get right here. So there is a n. So I should do one arithmetic uh, arithmetic sequence. So let's do one of those right now. Is the second version of that more correct? I'd say they're both correct. In my opinion, they're both the same. Uh, depends what you want to do with it. Uh, some forms would be better to have uh, one fourth to the n power. Probably the first one would be a little more useful overall, but I think we could say that they're definitely the same. So it just kind of depends on what you want to do. And you're going to see that where if, if your sequence starts at zero or one, you get something slightly different. You get an extra term if you started at zero. So there'll be times where it's important to start it at uh, zero or one, depending on what you're doing. Uh, I haven't 
written down anything that requires starting at zero versus one yet. So for our purposes, we don't need to worry about that. Uh, the countdown sequence, that's a good one. Let's, we'll just let this go to negative infinity. So what is happening between 10 and 9? Minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. So lots of minus 1s. So minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. So this is called arithmetic sequence. So think about minus one to the n. Every time you get n one more, you get another negative one. So if I let b n equal, this is multiplying right here, not power anymore. So we're multiplying. So n is one, you get negative one. n is two, you get negative two. n is three, negative three, negative four, negative five, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that. Uh, that pattern should be uh, pretty easy to see that we're counting down by one every time we increase n. This definitely doesn't start at 10 though. So if I want a1 to be 10, what do I have to do? So this isn't the sequence you're looking for. What do I have to do to make it the sequence that I know it can be? So I could, let's see, subtract. So we need to offset it. So how there's two ways I can offset it. What number can I add to it so that it will start at 10? 11. So I could add 11, and that will basically shift everything up, but it keeps the decreasing by one pattern going on. So we'll go an equals minus 1 to the n plus 11. So this is a linear function. Negative 1 to the n plus 11. The other way to do it, and you can do it with algebra, basically shift it backwards 11. So before we shift it backwards 2, this one shifts backwards 11. So we got negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. I would have to go back 11 more times to hit 10. So here's the idea of changing your index by bringing it back 11 uh, numbers. So which way is better? Just all depends on what you're trying to do with it. So I think that should be enough writing down the formula for the nth term. So let's talk about convergence. So convergence is property only of infinite sequence. The finite sequences stop at some point, so they never actually converge. They just stop. So converging is if you keep going in your sequence, does it get closer to a single number? So let's look at the sequences we've written down so far. So 10, 9, 8, 7, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Does that get close to any single number? if you keep going. Nope. It'll go past all the negative numbers. Keep going. So this is not going to converge. What about this right here? Negative 25, negative 5 fours, 5 sixteenths, negative 5 sixty fourths. What number is this getting close to? It's 
getting close to zero. And if you look right here, the AN formula, why is it getting close to zero? Because that negative one fourth gets super tiny when n gets really big. So this negative one fourth, because it's less than one, is going to get small when n is very big. So that would converge. What about this geometric series? 1 ninth, 1 27th, 1 81st. Yep, it gets close to zero. This one actually gets close even faster. No, that's not true. The other one was one fourth, that's one third. But it does get close to zero. And the first example definitely blew up. So it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So definitely not converging. So it doesn't make sense. If it stopped at 240, it wouldn't make sense to ask converging or not because you just have these five numbers. That's it. But if it goes forever, are the terms eventually getting close to a single value? So that's convergence. So let's change the notation a little bit. A is really a function of n, so you could write A with a little n next to it, or you can write it with proper function notation. So A is a function. The domain is really different than most functions we're used to. Domain of A is going to be Let's go z plus, so positive integers, which is sometimes zero is in there. So sometimes zero. So I might be very casual about zero because it doesn't really matter if we start at zero, or one, or two, or three, or 100. The idea of convergence happens at the end of the infinite sequence. So the first thousand million terms don't matter. It's what, matter what happens when n is really, really big, like million, billion, trillion. So that's why I don't really care if I start at zero, or one, or even a thousand. It really depends on when n is huge. So that'll be um, domain, and our range is the real numbers. So how do you formally define convergence? The sequence So we're going to write our sequence wrapping it with curly brackets. So the sequence converges to the number L, which is a real number, if lim n approaches infinity, A of n equals L. So that's some just going back to calc 1, basically. If your limit of your function exists and is not infinity or negative infinity, then it converges. So L cannot be plus or minus infinity. It's got to be a number. So not infinity or negative infinity. All right, so how do you diverge? You could uh, have a limit of infinity or negative infinity. That would be one way to converge. Another way to converge is if your sequence never actually settles down, keeps jumping around. So what's the easiest example of a non-converging sequence that does not go to infinity? easiest one I could think of is negative 1 to the n. So as a sequence, this would look like uh, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, etc, etc. So does this actually get close to a single real number? Nope. You could say it does sort of get close to 1, except negative 1. You're going to keep hitting negative 1, and that's never going to get close to 1. And you're going to also, you could say, 
some points are very close to negative one, but then you have the positive one points that don't, uh, that won't be close. So here's a really fast graph of the function, but it is not getting close to a single y value. It's close to two y values. So it does not converge. So this basically turns convergence into a calculus one problem. Of course, L'Hopital's rule, I could also put into this type of question. So you may have to use L'Hopital's rule to actually figure out convergence or divergence here. So let's go ahead and do that. Actually, I said this was a definition. That's not actually. Yeah, we'll take that as a definition. Uh, if we do look at uh, what does limit mean, it would basically mean the difference between L and AN is less than epsilon when N is really big. So to write out that epsilon delta definition, of convergence. So this means any epsilon greater than zero, uh, there exists. So I'm not gonna use the letter delta, but I'm going to use a big N greater than zero such that uh, a of n minus l is less than epsilon when n is greater than big N. So I will not put this on a midterm or final exam, so you don't have to worry about the epsilon uh, definition of uh, limit in this case. So let's partition that off. First example, an negative one to the n times two thirds to the n. All right, tell me if this converges or diverges. How do you do it? Take the limit. So lim n approaches infinity, a n. So you're probably gonna need L'Hopital's rule. So see if you can get this with L'Hopital's rule. Let's make this a tiny bit easier. Throw away the negative one to the n part. Just get rid of that. Make it a tiny bit easier. So I'll give you one minute. Tell me if it converges or not.
So how useful is L'Hopital's rule? I did, but I pretty much am where I started. Derivative 2 to the n is 2 to the n times ln2. Derivative 3 to the n, 3 to the n times ln2. So it didn't really change the problem very much. ln2 over ln3 is constant, it's a number. So I can pass that through the limit. And I'm pretty much right where I started. Locatel's rule, not so useful. So, what does your intuition say about two thirds to the n power? Should be getting smaller and smaller, right? Even if we can't use Locatel's rule effectively here. So, this will equal zero. And let's write down a general rule. Lim n approaches infinity r to the n power. It could be zero if what property does r need to have for this to equal zero? Less than one. So Definitely, if it's greater than zero, less than one, what about negative one half? That works. So I get some negatives. How negative can I go? I can go all the way, not all the way to negative one, but all the way up to negative one. So I can go from negative one to positive one. So one nice way to write that, absolute value of r less than one. So make sure r is small. So when would this limit equal one? Not very often. What R value makes this equal one? One. Now what if R is negative one? It's gonna go negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one. So basically any other R value is going to diverge. So any other R value is gonna diverge. So it does not exist if, or I should, let's just go otherwise. It's easier to write. So if you've got an R that's less than one absolute value, then you converge R equals one. It's a little silly to write out. You probably wouldn't write one to the nth power. That's always one. So pretty easy for this to not exist. So that is divergence and convergence. You basically just take a limit. A lot of times L'Hopital's rule could be useful, sometimes not. So this should help out right here. Uh, factorials, we'll deal with that. I'll give you some special rules for factorials, taking limits of factorials. Those are uh, nothing that you've seen before. have a theorem about adding, uh, multiplying, and dividing. So these are some algebraic properties. So let's suppose One lazy way to write a limit exists is to use this notation. So your sequence right arrow L. That means your sequence converges to L. And I don't need to write underneath 
you can if you want to as n approaches infinity, but all the limits that we do here are always n approaches infinity. So we're not going to do a sequence limit where n approaches 2, for example. So we're always going to be approaching infinity on our sequence limits. So I won't always write as n approaches infinity. Uh, and we need another sequence, bn, and we're going to suppose that approaches m. So we got one sequence that approaches the number l, a, another sequence that approaches number m. So the new sequence, add the terms together. So take the first terms, add them together. That'll be the uh, first term of the new sequence. Second two terms, add those two together. That'll be the new second term. Equal. All right, so this should and does approach L plus M. So we needed both both converge. Do need to write that down. Uh, another way to write that is L and M are both real numbers, not infinity and negative infinity. So they both converge. So our sum will converge, difference will converge, a n minus b n approaches l minus m, a n times b n approaches l times m, a n over b n approaches l over m but we need to be a little bit extra careful if we're going to be dividing. So if we're going to divide, I need to make sure m is not zero. Also, bn should not equal zero either if I'm going to be dividing a n by bn. So make sure you're not dividing by zero, you'll be okay. And we have constant multiple as well. C times A N is going to approach C times L. So sandwich theorem up next, you get uh, three sequences that are lined up with a small, medium, and large. So if a n less or equal to b n less or equal to c n. Now it seems like we would need this for all n values from one to infinity. However, we only need this. Uh, we're going to be talking about convergence, so I only need to worry about for all n values that are large. So for all n bigger than big N, for some big N. For some real number n. So we get this small, medium, large term like this. So if we get that, then lim n approaches infinity a n less than or equal to lim n approaches infinity b n less than or equal to lim n approaches infinity c n. So if the terms are lined up small, medium, large, you take limits and your limits will have that same uh, inequality relationship. And continuous function theorem. Ooh, is it time to leave? All right.